here today to uh, act as the chair of what I have no doubt will be an absolutely uh, exciting and interesting speech from Lord Finkelstein, just to explain how the structure of this evening will go. Lord Finkelstein will, Lord Finkelstein will be speaking for 35 to 40 minutes, um, and then I will be asking Lord Finkelstein a series of questions, and then we will open it up to the floor. Um, now, Lord Finkelstein is one of the most foremost British journalists. Uh, he is a weekly political columnist for the Times um, and an associate editor. Previously, Lord Finkelstein was the executive editor of the Times and he was once the chairman of the centre-right think tank, um, the Policy Exchange, which the Daily Telegraph describes as the largest and most influential think tank um, in the right of British politics. Lord Finkelstein is highly politically experienced and between 1997 to 2001 he served as an advisor to then leader of the opposition, William Hay. Without further ado, it is an absolute pleasure to introduce Lord Finkelstein. very safe hands if it has people doing that A-levels who can uh, <laughs> introduce things with such a form, and it's very nice to meet you. Um, it's very nice also to come here. I don't live very far away. I'm a, a pinner man, so uh, this is uh, around the corner. I was once asked to give a, a speech in Norwich, which involved me travelling for four hours, and when I got there, there were only two people there. Oh. Uh, one of them was the person that had invited me, and I swear this really happened. The other person waited until I finished speaking. They asked him whether he'd like to join the cause I was there for, and he said he would, but it would interfere with the terms of his parole. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a of a size of all these, no quality. And what I want to do is to uh, give you some idea about me by talking about the things I believe in. I want to talk about six things I believe in, and start with my belief in bourgeois stability. Uh, I was on a political panel uh, a few um, weeks ago, and someone in the audience asked me if I regretted the fact that there were no more big ideas in politics. And I thought for a moment, and I told her I thought big ideas were overrated, that big ideas had uh, killed my grandmother and imprisoned my uh, father and um, exiled my grandfather and stolen my neighbour's property and driven my family across the world, and I was quite happy with the small ideas of this country. Uh, I quite happily live without big ideas, and I like Britain and its suburbs and its bourgeois, boring stability and its small ideas. As I told the House of Lords in my maiden speech, uh, my mother was in Belson and my father was in Siberia and Pinna is nicer. <laughs> um, uh, my grandmother used to describe her, uh, her views this, which is uh, thus, which is um, while the... While the Queen is safe in Buckingham Palace, we are safe in Hendon Central. And this was uh, rather a good description of my politics. What makes this country a great place for Jews is its pragmatism, its slow, gradual moderation, its bourgeois complacency, precisely the things that visionaries view with impatience and disdain. And all of this is worth saying, I think, now, because uh, there's a mood abroad that I think is profoundly dangerous for Jews. Let me try and summarise it like this. Um, the country is being run by the metropolitan elite, the bankers, the lawyers, the bureaucrats, the media and the politicians. And of that group, the latter are the worst, lying to the people, lining their own pockets, out of touch. The politicians are incompetent at best and crooks at worst. And you can never get a straight answer to a straight question. No wonder no one votes, and quite right too. And you hear all this just as often inside our own community as from anyone else. It's a bit like asking someone about the weather. It's a common refrain about politicians. Yet in my view, when people start attacking the international money men and the cosmopolitan elite, that's not a good moment for the Jews to join in. It is to feel slightly nervous that is our correct reaction. When people attack politicians as useless and greedy, the right reaction is to wonder what the alternative is to politicians. Is it a more heroic master race of politicians or someone who looks good on a horse uh, at a night rally dressed in white? And is that really such a great idea? When the leader comes along to purify the nation and sweep away corruption, who do we think will be doing the sweeping and who will be the swept? Uh, politics. 
is not often nice to see being done. And that's usually because we uh, overinterpret all of the things that happen in politics. We think that everyone's following politics and the things that, ma that uh, happen every day are the things that are moving opinion up and down and we wonder at their triviality uh, and think, could this really be all that there is? But the truth about it is most people, most of the time, don't follow politics and they don't follow politicians. So when Andrew Mitchell left uh, Downing Street and on his way out, uh, he did or didn't call the policeman a player. Everyone said, you know, this is going to have a huge effect on David Cameron's popularity because, uh, you know, the Tories are snobbies, uh, snobs and he's called him a snobbish term. And I always knew it would have no impact at all. This is because nobody knows who Andrew Mitchell is. And nobody knows what a chief whip is. Nobody knew which party he belonged to. Most people uh, didn't read the paper that day. If they did read the paper that day, they forgot what was in it. If they remembered what was in it, they don't believe what they read in the newspapers. Most people don't believe believe policemen or politicians, and lots of people don't know what a pleb is. <laughs> that doesn't mean to say they don't know that it's an insult, but they don't think of it as a class-rated uh, insult, so it didn't have the impact that you would anticipate it would have. It would have. I went to a restaurant once with a friend, and on the television there was a um, football game, and my friend pointed out that I wrote a football column for the Times on Saturdays, and uh, she was really interested in the woman behind the counter. She started asking me loads of questions about uh, the Times newspaper and what I did, and writing about football, and then it turned out I wrote about politics. She said she was really interested in that, and so she started asking me questions about you know the Times and its coverage of politics and politics in general, and at no point did she notice that my friend was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the fact is people don't notice or know or follow all these kind of political issues and sometimes this dis the fact that people don't understand this distorts our political coverage so during the general election you'll recall there was this issue about whether David Cameron should debate with um, Tony Blair and, sorry with, um, with Ed Miliband and um, Really, there was no, there was nothing to be gained for David Cameron to do that because Ed Miliband was so far behind him. All he could do was let Ed Miliband back into the election by debating him. The problem was, lots of people thought, if he doesn't debate, people will hate that and he'll be accused of cowardice and this will be a, mis uh, a big mistake. But my advice to him was, well, nobody will uh, follow a process issue like that. You can make the decision that you want because people don't care about that sort of issue. This was partly informed by the analysis I've just given you, but partly informed by my experience working for John Major. Tony Blair um, had refused to debate John in the 1997 general election, and uh, in Conservative Central Office it was thought sagacious to dress an actor as a, um, as a chicken and follow Tony Blair around the country to point out that he was a coward. Uh, and this had absolutely no impact whatsoever on the general election campaign, except to make us look even more ridiculous than we already did. Um, the only thing that happened was that we had to employ a house of work actor, obviously, to do this role as a chicken. And he went around watching Tony Blair so often that he began to find him very persuasive. <laughs> so I got a telephone call for him and he said, Danny, we're really concerned that the chicken is going to the effect of the Labour Party. <laughs> to have lunch with the chicken every day for the rest of the campaign to try and persuade him not to join them. And I would say we lost in a landslide, but the chicken did not cross the road. Um, <laughs> the, the point about all these things is that, is that uh, the small things are not what influences politics. The things that change people's political uh, mind are very big things. They're their own background in history, uh, their own social class, their attitude to who they think is fit to govern. I remember on general election day, the last general election, saying to my friend who ran a polling company, you know, I've read your poll and it looks like we're going to lose the general election. And he point, he said, remember Finkelstein's law of politics says Ed Miliband can't win. Uh, and I said, you know, I'm hanging on to that because it really does say that. Uh, in other words, who is fit to be Prime Minister, who people think uh, can win, uh, that is absolutely crucial, that big thing. And the other thing that changes people's political attitudes is um, what their experiences of their own life. You can't tell someone the economy is growing. Partly they don't understand what growth is necessarily, what it means. Partly uh, people don't think in percentage terms. And partly they don't believe what you're saying. The only way that growth will affect the election is if it's actually happening. The only way that the government will be able to run on its record on crime is if at the time the election is coming, people don't feel they're surrounded by um, criminals. Uh, and that's the same uh, on all the big issues. You can't run on security unless people feel secure. In other words, um, 
people concentrate on the things that go into politics, but what they should be looking at is, broadly speaking, how are we governed as a country. And my own view is that, um, particularly given my family background, we live in one of the most prosperous, peaceful uh, places in the world. We live in one of the, uh, you know, one of the, and we live, by the way, in one of the nicest parts of it, Bushy, Pinner and North. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a stable place. At my 50th birthday party, I was able to say to my friends who was there uh, that the disaster that had befallen my grandparents and my parents had not befallen me. Uh, you know, um, I, I've been able to bring up my children in peace in, in our area uh, and uh, not uh, be chased uh, around the world by dictators. In other words, we've done not a bad job. Politics isn't heroic because what it does is to conciliate interests. It takes everybody's opinion uh, and everybody's interest, no matter how reasonable uh, their opinion is and no matter how uh, selfish their, their interest is, and it attempts to conciliate it with everyone else while maintaining everybody's rights. And that is an incredibly difficult job to do, uh, as, if, as anybody who's, dealt, who's been on the Synagogue Council knows. You know, we're, every Jewish organisation one belongs to ends up with everyone being Broikers. And the, 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 the politics is just about that on a massive scale and having to consider all those interests. And it doesn't do a bad job. Uh, but you can't expect it to look heroic. It's not going to look like that. And so I think one of its... Um, best, greatest advantage is almost its um, rather banal nature. Um, well, alongside this criticism of democratic politics comes criticism of the market economy. So one can never go uh, to anybody's bar mitzvah without the rabbi attacking consumerism. And I always say that I never knew what Pogan Pole Kitchen was until it got uh, attacked in a sermon that my mum had to explain. <laughs> what Pogan Pole was. Um, and personally, I'm always a bit baffled by uh, attacks on consumerism. You know, I look at the history of the world, and I look at the world in which we live in, and you see war and hunger and disease uh, and, you know, and famine and pestilence and natural disaster and people committing terrible crimes and people committing terrible murders. And here we are worried about shopping. Uh, you know, it seems to me that of all the things that, that mankind has ever developed, shopping is among the most benign things that you can imagine. Indeed, shopping is usually my solution to most of the world's problems. <laughs> I do think that if people were busy in the changing room of Topshop, uh, they would be much more difficult for them to be chopping each other's heads off. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, um, and I think that where... Uh, uh, bourgeois stability and shopping reaches people, it defeats most political forces and it has more power than most political forces and uh, where you see great dictatorships or uh, instability or murders or intolerances arise, you can usually discover a failure at the check uh, <coughs> checkout till, in other words the collapse of shopping uh, at the root of it. Uh, Maureen that always said that she would like to be buried in Red Cross shopping because <coughs> then she'd know that her daughter would visit her once a week. Um, and I was brought up in Hendon Central, uh, just round the corner from Red Cross Shopping Centre, and my great boast of my childhood that I could walk to Red Cross Shopping Centre without having to cross the road, so my mum could let me uh, go to the Phoenix. Um, and uh, you know, my my, uh, my father, um, went, who was um, in other ways a, a very sort of educated uh, person, and um, you know, I would say his hobby, and this is not joking, was the study of the 19th century Polish uh, rabbinic movement. Um, he he uh, nevertheless regarded uh, being able to buy a prepared sandwich in Marks and Spencer's as the height of culture. Uh, and, and, um, and my parents were literally set off in a car to go to Tesco to eat, to eat in the cafe. Um, and um, they, they correctly understood that that is the height of civilization. I always you know, say that um, most people in the world are struggling for the human right to work in the dry cleaning, uh, in, in uh, Alpine dry cleanings in Nutsbridge Road. Uh, that is uh, much better than most people do in life, and, it's a, and uh, we, we sneer at that at our peril. This uh, banal shopping uh, is actually a great uh, civilising and um, a great civilising achievement. Okay, so the first thing I believe in is a bourgeois stability, the second is shopping, and the third is in fairness. Now, most of people will have been in a hotel in which you will have seen a little sign that says, please uh, hang your hotel towel back on the rack if you want to help the environment. <coughs> You'll have seen that. And we all think to ourselves, this is not about the environment. Let's face it, this is about the hotel's laundry bill. Uh, and so we drop the towel. <laughs> and so what the Holiday Inn was 
saying was, how can we write this card so as to encourage people to hang their towel uh, back on the rack? And so what they did was, uh, they did a number of different ways, and the one that was most successful was this. 75% of people staying in this hotel hang their hotel towel back on the rack during their stay. And this increased it from 38% to 48%. <laughs> then they put this. 75% of people staying in your room hang their towel back on the rack during their stay. This increased it from 38% to 58%. We are all incredibly keen to be loyal to the uh, sort of the room culture uh, set by someone we've never met in the, uh, you know, in the sort of Minnesota holiday in room 728. Uh, and uh, we want to know, this is the reason why nobody else has, nobody's turned up tonight wearing speedos. We want to know, roughly speaking, how everyone else is going to behave when we behave. Too. So if I said to you about someone, he looks like a geography teacher, you would begin to nod because you know what I'm talking about, even though how can someone look like a geography teacher? Okay. Well, the answer is, if you be, uh, become a geography teacher, you slowly but surely begin to look like all the other geography teachers, because no one wants to stand out in the staff. But, uh, it's also the case that if you already look like a geography teacher, you're more likely to become one. This is obviously a little bit more suspicious as a suggestion, but it is true that uh, the, the study of the American Dental Association suggests that people who are called Dennis are more likely than Iran to become dentists. Um, and people who are called Florence are more likely to move to Florida. People who are called Louise are more likely to move to Louisiana. These are small, but they're statistically significant, replicable findings. They're not data drawing for those of you with a methodological interest. Um, so, so um, the interesting question is, why does this happen? And before, but before I explain it, I should just say, it has an important consequence, this fact. Uh, so most of us would believe that, uh, as there's an obesity epidemic in this country, the thing that we need to do is make sure everyone's aware that there's an obesity epidemic. Uh, but nothing could be more disastrous than that piece of advice. After all, I've just explained to you what happens when you tell people that what everyone else does with their towels. What do you think happens when you tell everybody that everybody else is fat? Right? Uh, it's have another canopy. I didn't realize everyone was fat. Um, so um, it's also true that if you have litter campaigns, which often people do, which say, you know, everywhere you go, people are throwing litter out of their car windows. This encourages people to throw litter out of their car windows. By the way, more seriously, in the Jewish community, we often say the BBC is biased against, um, against Israel. This is a typical BBC report. What do we think the impact will be on a BBC journalist when informed the norm inside their organisation is to be against Israel? In other words, we're normalising behaviour that we <coughs> uh, in, the, in the Arizona State Forest, they used to have this big sign that said... Um, don't, uh, please stop stealing the petrified wood. If it goes on like this, uh, we, uh, we'll soon run out. And people's attitude was, I'm going to get mine now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're doing, basically, with the BBC. We're normalising it by saying that uh, this um, is the way in which people in the organisation behave. But I said to you that, that this, that's a consequence. I said to you I'd try and explain why it happened. Well, the reason is this. Uh, you have to ask yourself the question, why do we cooperate with people who don't share our genes? We all understand why we cooperate with someone who shares our genes. That's you know, perfectly reasonable um, uh, thing for people to understand. But we cooperate with people who do not share our genes because we think that if we do a favour for them, they will do it back. And this has been a good evolutionary strategy. But it has a hole in it. What happens if I do a favour for you and you don't do it back? We have to guard against that, and the way we guard against it is by trying to make sure that we trust the people that we're dealing with, and we use as a shortcut to that trust, do they look like me? And we use as a shortcut for getting people to trust us, I look like you. So we are fitting in with other people's behaviour in order that we will gain their trust, and they'll be willing to trade with us. One of the reasons why the world has become, despite all that we seem to think, a more peaceful place is that television and the internet mean that we think more people look like us. Uh, and um, therefore those, those things are, despite the fact that we've got more lethal weaponry, uh, a force for good because they help people to understand what, how other people behave. So uh, if you understand this, you'll immediately see what the heart political issues will be, what the gut political issues will be. They will be ones where we think we put in and someone else is taking out. They will be welfare fraud. Why do people always think that the welfare fraud system is, uh, is being defrauded? It's not just because of their observation. Some people who have that view never 
experienced it at all. Um, they just watch it on the news or they read it in the paper. But we have a feeling to start off with that someone else is getting away with what we've put in. Uh, crime is that has the same uh, profile. This is one of the reasons why people are so concerned about immigration. It's not a cultural issue. It's uh, there is an issue of trust, though, by the way, in people whether they look like us. But there's an issue of also of I put in, and these people are using the services I've paid for. Uh, whether or not that's a reasonable attitude is secondary to the fact that it's an instinctive one. Bankers' bonuses. If equality was the fairness norm, you would imagine that bankers' bonuses had always been a huge issue. But they were not a huge issue until the banking crash. They became a huge issue when they triggered the reciprocity fairness norm. That is, I put in, they take out. Right? When the bankers began to be not contributors, but people who appeared to others to be taking money out, then it seemed completely outrageous that they earned these big bonuses, which had never been a big political issue before, but became a massive political issue uh, because of that. Uh, MP salaries uh, are not very large, and MP's expenses, it would take 35,000 years for the abolition of MP's expenses to close the... Um, but to, the, to close the deficit. And yet people are very concerned about it, mostly because they think MPs are useless, and therefore they're taking out, not putting in. And it's the amounts don't matter so much as the fact that it triggers that fairness norm. So my belief is that we are much too ready to believe that we're the ones that put in, and other people are the ones that take out. That we're much too ready to think uh, that uh, we've been diddled in this deal, and most of the time the other people are thinking that back too. And it would be better for the whole of mankind if we tried to stop for a second and wondered whether it was really true that we're the great contributors and that other people are the great people who are taking out. This is an incredibly uh, strong view within us. It's instinctive. It's part of your identity, probably, and certainly part of mine, to believe that I'm the great contributor and other people are taking out when I'm putting in. Uh, but it's actually uh, much less true than you think it is uh, about you and about me and about all of us. Um, and um, it's a much better idea if we could bring ourselves to accept um, that we take out, that we take out as well, uh, and that we don't always contribute as much as in our heads we think that we do. Okay. The next thing I believe in is in the power of truth. Uh, a couple of weeks ago I went to um, New York and I visited, as I always do, the Statue of Liberty, which is one of the great um, uh, monuments in the world, but it has a particular meaning for me. Um, in uh, 1945, the beginning of 1945, three young girls were in a boat called the Gripshold, uh, which was coming from Switzerland uh, to, um, to Ellis Island. And these girls had been in Belsall concentration camp, the mother had died, but they had on them uh, their father's uh, First World War medals. Their father was going to meet them in, uh, in New York, uh, and they had had these medals because uh, their mother had thought this would help them in Belsall. Basically, they'd be able to show that my grandfather had been a, uh, as, as he was, had been a uh, contributor to uh, the German uh, war effort, and therefore they should allow uh, them, uh, you know, some slack for being uh, patriotic Germans. Well, naturally, as you can imagine, this had no impact at all. And the girls had these medals, uh, and they had to decide what to do with them. Uh, and they were worried that if they entered Ellis Island with the medals, they would be thought to be spies. So they opened the porthole, they wrapped the medals in a handkerchief, and they dropped them into the uh, into the river by um, the Statue of Liberty. <coughs> which is one of the reasons why I always go. Um, well, as I, as I said, slightly spoiling the point, uh, slightly spoiling my story too early, uh, the girls, one of the three girls was my mother. And um, the reason why this story is important to me is because uh, my grandfather, I was told when I was young, was quite annoyed that his First World War medals had ended up in the uh, <laughs> And when I was a child, I really couldn't understand it seemed to me an obvious thing to do, and why would he want the German First World War medals anyway? Uh, and only as an adult have I understood his reaction. My, my grandfather was the great archivist of the, of the anti-Nazi movement, he was a man called Alfred Winger, and in the 1920s he came to the view that uh, the best thing that he could do to uh, fight the Nazis was to try to use the truth uh, to expose what they did. And at first what he did was to, to try to alert the German middle classes to what the Nazis were really trying to do by collecting together all their anti-Semitic material, uh, by displaying them, giving 
going around the country giving talks, uh, trying to uh, lobby all sorts of organisations that he thought might be sympathetic. And naturally, this work, this didn't work. Um, but, it would, but during the process, he began a collection, which is now called the Wheeler Library, but it was a collection of all the material that told the stories of what, saw the story of what the Nazis did. And uh, he brought this to London in 1939, um, and uh, one of the and he unfortunately was not able to get his family to have to visas in time before Holland was invaded. And in 1939, he opened the library, and the library was used by the British <coughs> government to know what the uniforms of the Nazis were, what were they doing, what had happened to Kristallna, what uh, was the truth that they could use in British propaganda efforts, uh, how did they understand the way that Hitler works, which uh, Nazi was which. And after the war, it was used uh, as part of the Nuremberg trials and part of Adolf Eichmann's trials. And we know from the trial of Saddam or from of Milosevic, actually you, you know instinctively these people have committed crimes, but you've got to actually be able to prove them. And what the material that my grandfather collected was able to do was to prove what they'd done. And it also proved something a bit bigger than that, uh, which I also hadn't understood. Until, uh, even, until the early 1950s, really, people had not accepted or understood that the, uh, that the Nazi uh, genocide had been a genocide against the Jews, that what had happened in the Holocaust had been aimed specifically at Jewish people. Uh, indeed, when the uh, library had come to London, it was originally called uh, the, the, the Institute of Jewish Affairs, and it had had to change its name because the British government was concerned that all of the evidence that it was presenting to the British public would be presented by Jews, and so therefore it was called the Wheeler Library, uh, partly to avoid that uh, problem, which a title my grandfather never liked. And the, this um, library was basically a tool to make people understand what had happened. So I've grown, I've grown up my whole life believing very powerfully in the power of truth, that um, trying to expose uh, what, uh, things that happen and uh, having, a, having a free press and free speech are very important human rights, that transparency is absolutely vital, uh, that historical uh, truth is important uh, and that you have to fight for it. And this has always been uh, important because I've understood from my grandfather how important it is. Uh, in Belson, my, my, grand, uh, my aunt and my mum uh, had been standing at the wires when their friend from, um, from, their, from Amsterdam had arrived in Belson, which was Anne Frank and her sister Margot. And my, my aunt wrote down in her book that Anne Margot Frank had arrived in Belson. And this I found using, that uh, I've needed to use in my own journalism against people who say that that whole story was faked. Um, so I know from direct experience the importance of uh, truth and of reporting and of direct accounts. But here's the fifth thing I believe, the power of truth is not enough by itself. The, um, you may remember the MP uh, in the last parliament called David Ward who said uh, the problem with the Jews is they don't understand the lesson, that they haven't learned the lesson of the Holocaust. It was a monumentally offensive thing to say and one of the reactions I had was that he was actually trying to explain to my mother how she, uh, what lessons she should have learned from Hitler, you know, and how offensive really uh, is that. Uh, extraordinary uh, thing to say. Uh, but it also was stupid, as well as offensive, uh, because he misunderstood the lesson of the Holocaust. Yes, of course, one of the lessons of the Holocaust is the lesson of every activity in which we engage, from the most banal to the most important, which is that it's good to be kind to other people and to try to uh, regard other people uh, in a compassionate light and to be as nice as possible as you can be to people. But the other thing that the Holocaust uh, taught was more specific to it, which was that the next time someone tries to kill all the Jews, it would be quite a good idea if we had some weapons. Uh, and um, it would be quite a good idea if we weren't completely defenceless and dependent entirely on the international community which allowed the Jews almost to be exterminated in the, in the, second, in the second World War. In other words, the, the lesson of the Holocaust was almost precisely the opposite of the one that he was suggesting. It suggested that uh, the importance of Israel having the ability to defend itself and taking a pretty rigorous attitude to that defence and not allowing that defence to be dependent entirely upon uh, the good opinion of the international community was one of the core lessons of, uh, the, of the Holocaust. Um, you know, my grandfather had um, been very reliant on that uh, international opinion and it hadn't come to his rescue. Indeed, my grandfather actually had been um, one of the uh, prime campaigners for an assimilationist Germany. And in the pre interwar years, he'd actually written a book about 
uh, which was called Travels in Palestine, in which he argued, look, I've been to Palestine, I'm an Arabist, um, we don't want to live there. Uh, there'll be a war. Uh, these people will never let us uh, settle in the land, because there are people living there already, it will be very difficult to create a state. And on top of this, it's miles from the nearest Delhi. Why would we, why would, when we live in Berlin, why would Earth really want to live in some of these places, right? It's absolutely terrible. Uh, and so he, um, this was part of his argument, and the, 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 the argument back from the Zionists was, um, well, that's all very well, but if we stay here, we're all going to get killed. The great tragedy of the Jews was they were both right. My grandfather was right that uh, they wouldn't be easy, it wouldn't be easy to obtain peace in the Middle East, uh, and they were right that if they stayed in Germany, they'd all be killed. Uh, and um, part of the lesson uh, for that is we uh, have to be able to defend as a community, to be able to defend ourselves. My grandfather was completely right about the power of truth, uh, but it wouldn't have been much use to him without the power of uh, gunships. If you, uh, the, uh, my wife had a crisis comment yesterday when she saw that uh, Jeremy Corbyn had called for, um, for the Germans and, the, um, and, and British and Americans to, uh, to negotiate for peace. And he, she said, well, has he tried telling that to ISIS? Um, you know, uh, the, the, the truth is that sometimes people are rather immune to that kind of uh, blanchment, and uh, you have, unfortunately in those circumstances you have to use um, military methods where talking won't do, even though uh, talking is obviously being Jewish our preferred cure. Um, so, um, so I believe in truth, but I also believe that the power of truth is not enough by itself. Let me just finish with one final thing uh, that I believe before we have our discussion and then I'll take uh, other questions. I also believe in Judaism. Um, I, I wouldn't tell you that I'm the, um, the most, uh, I suppose, uh, the most orthodox of people. I'm a liberal Jew um, and I struggle all the time with the concept of supernatural God. Um, and um, I take a different view that is standard in the United Synagogue community to um, the development of tradition and the relationship of developing ideas with tradition. Uh, but uh, I do share this, I think, with everyone in the room. I believe that there is a wisdom in tradition, and uh, the, one of the great joys of life is the uh, attempt to try to understand what, it, what tradition means and what we can learn from it. What is the wisdom in all of the teaching? How can we draw it out? My father, in the last two weeks of his life, he knew he was dying, uh, was still studying the Talmud. Uh, it was very inspiring to me. I knew, he knew he was going to die with that uh, wisdom, that he wasn't going to be able to pass it to anyone else. And yet, uh, for him, he was trying to extract, uh, even in that period uh, where he knew it would go nowhere, he was trying to extract from it uh, the meaning, and he found that one of the most enjoyable pursuits of his life. And I think he was right. Um, there is there is something um, that uh, about the fact that we have to chase that truth and we never catch it uh, that is profoundly satisfying. We also have, um, as part of our Judaism, this incredible uh, sense of community. Uh, I, I'm a great believer in an integrated Britain, um, uh, but I do think that uh, while I do think that being British is one of the most amazing things to be able to boast, uh, it's not even quite as amazing as being able to boast that I'm a British Jew. Uh, and um, I think we're very lucky to have that. Uh, we're very lucky that we have a sense of uh, comradeship, all of us, uh, in a completely inexpressible way, even though we've, most of us never met before. Uh, and um, that, that's an immensely precious thing, which I, I enjoy um, all the time, which I'm pleased to say to my uh, children enjoy too. And it's important also in all that I've said, for all that I am um, a pragmatist and a moderate and quite materialist uh, in my outlook and um, also uh, as I've um, explained to somebody who believes that um, some of the most banal of human pleasures are incredibly socially important, um, I do think it's very important to understand there's something bigger than us uh, and uh, to aspire to that uh, to try again to understand that, uh, particularly receiving it through practice and um, through argument, which are the Jewish methods. Um, and um, I think that it's a very precious um, thing to have, and that without it, of course, um, the materialism can sour. Uh, so um, I hope that in this way I've given you some little idea about who I am and what I think. Um, I, I, 
together, I basically think um, that uh, this country is a very good place for Jewish people to live, and we're lucky to live in it in the 21st century. Uh, that isn't to say that we can ever be complacent about the things that it offers, uh, but uh, some of the things that I think we're often most impatient about, uh, the fact that this, uh, the fact that uh, this country doesn't have grand visions, um, and uh, the fact that the uh, politicians in the country are uh, banal and our politics quite stable, uh, those are the things that most people get agitated about that I like about it the most. Thank you. I know that you and I were having this conversation before you began, but when I was doing my research into Lord Finkelstein, there was something I found particularly fascinating, which was that you were a very involved member of the SDP, a Labour Party break-off, and you would go on and defect to the Conservative Party at the same time the SDP and the Liberal Party would merge into the Liberal Democrats. Why did you leave, and why the Tories? Yeah, well, it's very funny because this now all seems so incredibly arcane, and I always <laughs> joke about it. Uh, uh, on, I, on the first date with the person that became my wife, I, I started to talk to her about the difference between the Social and Liberal Democrats and the Social Democratic Party. It's amazing she married me, really. <laughs> um, so I don't want to bore everyone with too much of this detail, but basically, um, you know, my, my politics, as I've explained, are are kind of uh, moderate and um, they are, uh, you know, I sort of, I'm, a, I'm an Atlanticist, um, sort of strong on defence. Um, I'm conservative with a small c about a lot of political change. And when the SD, when I didn't want to join the Liberal Party, which I've never taken particularly seriously, and which was too left wing for me. And I thought that they, when the Social Democrats joined <coughs> with the Liberal Party, that's the sort of party it would create. Uh, and um, Although, and I'd always had a slightly ambivalent relationship to Margaret Thatcher, which was that I didn't, I never much liked her, um, but I thought she was probably right about most things, uh, which is a slightly odd thing. Uh, that's the way I still feel about her. Uh, and uh, but by, not, by, by the time I joined the, uh, by the time the SDP, David Owens SDP finally hit the buffers, Margaret Thatcher was no longer Prime Minister, John Major was, um, and I liked him a lot better. Um, and so, it just seemed the natural thing to do. I mean, of course, one of the things I could do was not be involved in politics, but I found that impossible because I loved and found it really, really interesting. And I haven't regretted it at all. Um, you know, the Conservative Party was a, is a bigger party and a party of power, um, and that means that there'll be more people in it that you don't agree with, whereas the SDP was a small political party that was on the fringe, and therefore it was tighter, uh, and you had less people that you disagreed with, but the other hand, you wouldn't have. So, um, I found that, particularly as it's evolved, and I'm quite sympathetic with the current leadership, um, it was the right decision. You would go on and serve as the director of the Conservative Research Department and have a very close relationship with John Major. And you were seen in the party as a modernist. You wanted to modernise the Tories. Mm -hmm. What exactly did that mean, and do we see that today in the Tory party? Yeah, so um, there were... There was a right, there were sort of two things that I think it made really. Um, one is that uh, I thought the party had become quite pessimistic and angry. Uh, I think um, a free market Atlanticist party ought to be very welcoming about modern society and about the way the world is changing. My whole philosophy is optimistic and I think um, we live in a very great place and we're lucky to live there. And I didn't, you know, um, we can always work on improving things, but um, I felt the Conservative Party was sort of angry and pessimistic in tone. Um, and um, so there was a whole, so I felt the party needed to change the whole way it talked and approached people and, it's, and it needed to be broader and more tolerant and what uh, And secondly, more specifically, I, I, was, I'm more, I was more socially liberal than the party. I thought electorally that was very important because uh, the country, the more and more people were becoming graduates, the Conservative Party had to appeal to those people and uh, it couldn't do so if it wasn't socially liberal because those people were socially liberal. So therefore it was going to, it was losing elections straightforwardly. Um, and you know, one of the great good fortunes about uh, my sort of political life is that the, the two or three 
people I shared that with and whom I began to sort of plot with and have drinks with and lunch with and try to work out schemes were Michael Go, George Osborne and David Cameron. Uh, and, and, um, and that was very good fortune and they shared that view and therefore we were and has it have we managed to achieve it? Well um, not as much as you would want but, um, but also uh, not as little as some people suggest. So at the general election, uh, the reason the Conservative Party won the general election is because it won more votes from centre uh, people who had voted Liberal Democrat and Labour than it lost to UKIP. And that's the reason why the Conservative Party won the election. That is only possible because David Cameron moved the party towards the centre and made it more socially liberal, won more graduate support, uh, and that was able to compensate for what I think was an inevitable loss of support to other uh, political parties. So, it, and, and then one of the results of that was the Labour Party didn't feel it could inhabit that space and has been pushed out to the left. Uh, so it's been politically quite successful, but there's always more you can do. And my final question before I open it up would be you regularly, or fairly regularly, will write and comment on your thoughts on Israel. And a question a lot of the Jewish community have is, are the Israeli, or is the Israeli government policy of continued settlement building detrimental to the peace process? Well, uh, okay. Uh, so the number of things. The, the first is I really disagree with that policy. Um, I, I, I basically believe the only possible future for uh, it, Israel is a two-state solution, uh, and ultimately, if you um, put settlements down, you're going to be faced with a situation whereby you can't create two states. If you can't create two states, you end up having a one-state solution, and the only way that the one state can be an Israeli state is if you introduce a system of differentiated um, uh, citizenship, which is morally unacceptable. Um, so, um, I think it is a strategic error of great proportions, and I, and I oppose it. Um, do I think that it's the cause of um, lack of peace? Absolutely not. Um, one of the points that I always make is when people say that Israel should retreat behind 1967 borders, the point I always make to people is there was a time when Israel retreated behind 1967 borders, which was like 1966, for instance. Um, so what happened then? Uh, the answer is that um, you know, in 1966, 1948 and 1973, Israel was basically within borders, and the other countries tried to drive it into the sea. Uh, it's just not true that if Israel was behind 1967 borders, it will have uh, peace. Um, you know, I always argue, um, I have a very, very simple peace plan, uh, and it's for uh, the Palestinians to stop killing the Jews. Uh, and if that happens, there'll be peace. Um, and there'll be two states, uh, by the way. Um, I worry about Israel making that hard, so that point that I make so simply is no longer true, and that will be a disaster. Uh, but um, while it remains uh, the case, I think that, um, you know, depressingly, if you look at the Middle East now, one of the things that I said in, when in the House of Lords there was a debate in, about recognising Palestine, <coughs> I said, you know, what sort of state do uh, members of the Lords want to create? Uh, do they want it to be like Saudi Arabia? Uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, Egypt, um, exactly what, you know, uh, exactly Libya, what exactly what sort of state are they in? Where, in fact, in the Middle East is there one example of the state with which we can coexist with the possible exception of Jordan? Uh, and, um, you know, it's not a very, it's not a very um, encouraging picture. But nevertheless, the only possibility is that ultimately uh, we'll create a two-state solution because the Palestinians who've rejected that over and over again decide that they can't get anything else. And it's on that note, I am delighted to open up to everyone. If you listen to Saeed Harakat uh, on various programmes, including Hard Talk, uh, the whole of his, I don't know what to call it, discourse or narrative or response to, uh, what's his name, the guy who runs the programme, I can't remember his name. It's basically, you're in our land, you've always been our, in our land, ever since the time when Joshua ben Nun attacked us. And he said that. And he's supposed to be the principal negotiator of the Palestinians, several Palestinians. What can you say to that in relation to a two-state solution? Do you know, one of the things about it is that 
and, and this gets into a whole issue of doctrine, and I don't want to argue with you here, but one of the things I often uh, reply to that is, um, well, let's say that's true. Okay? Uh, what do you propose to do about it now? Um, so, um, it's absolutely possible to read the history of, um, of the land of Israel from a Palestinian point of view and reach Syed Arakat's conclusion. It's not mad. Uh, it's historically tenable. We can argue with it, and there's absolutely a counter narrative. Uh, and uh, but but right, but even if it were true and correct, it doesn't mean that now uh, they haven't got to live with the two-state solution because there are now millions of people living there who want, uh, and, um, and they have to adjust to it. Um, so it doesn't get them it, the. Getting into that particular argument doesn't help either way. We're never going to settle it. They're never going to accept that that's not the case. What we need to do is to get them to accept pragmatically. They have to settle for the, um, for the situation as it now is. And, and, of course, we can have historical debates about what was the situation in 1947. Uh, surely, I mean, surely um, the question of Palestine and Israel at this present moment, and has been pretty much since the death of um, yeah. is that you know, we see such great leadership whether it be Gorbachev during the 20th century you know, we've seen these moments of extraordinary leadership and we're seeing some of, some of it now I mean to say in the uh, transatlantic and so on and so forth but I've never seen a courageous leader stand up who is Palestinian and take the nation by its Strap it there because they look, we can show you a better way. You're going to have to give something up, but there doesn't seem to be the courage of leadership within the Arab world that will take it to this too. And I, well, haven't, I haven't seen it ever. Yeah, so that shows them we're going to and they killed them. You know, I mean, that's the, the truth is it's very, very difficult because the courage that you require is quite large. Um, uh, the warriors normally stand up, don't they? Eventually, they do, whether it be yes. Ireland or wherever. You're, you're, you're correct in, in suggesting that that is. The only solution. So that can we not, is there no one there that one can? Well, not at the moment, not as far as I can see. But you never know, it's the most unexpected. So, talking of leaders, um, Jeremy Corbyn, um, on your premise that you need, you need to have an electable, credible uh, Prime Minister, that Corbyn is, is worse than the Miliband, so is it, is it a correct assumption that he, he won't, 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 won't be in? And therefore, do the Conservatives he won't, want, he won't get in at the next oh. election? So the Conservatives want to keep him there for the next five years. Yeah. Well, okay, so the, the truth is that the Conservatives can't do much about it. Now, during the election, the senior cabinet minister sort of said to me, "Do we want Corbyn to win because he's so terrible, or do we want?" Uh, but the problem with him is he might not last till the election. Or would it be better for um, for Burnham to win because uh, he's? He's less rubbish than Corbyn, but he's rubbish enough not to win, so, but he'll stay. Right? Uh, and I said, you know, the thing is um, that, uh, George, uh, that you, um, <laughs> you, that's not your decision. Um, and so, um, uh, and that's true, you know, it's not up to the Conservatives what So it's, it's not, the, the, the Labour Party has got a system which is difficult to, um, where it's quite difficult to get rid of the leader of the party. I, I, they create what they call a market failure of political coups. Uh, you, you have to run against it. You have to be the person that runs against it. And the problem with that is that you gain all the costs. You have all the costs. When the benefits are spread to everyone, but the costs are concentrated on the individual who challenges Corbyn. Um, and um, it's not obvious whether they can find that credible person who's going to be the challenger and that whether the challenger can win. Uh, so I think they're in a lot of trouble as to whether they can get rid of him. And he can't, and he, he absolutely can't win the election. But it's worse than whether he can't win the election. They can't vote for him. That's the problem. If you are, if you are a, uh, you know, even a Hillary Benn, you know, the, the shadow foreign secretary will have difficulty voting for Jeremy Corbyn to be prime minister. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very difficult situation to be in. So, um, but the question of whether he'll survive to the election. Um, doesn't depend on what Jeremy, what uh, Hillary Benn thinks. So my um, advice to Jeremy Corbyn this morning is that he's not being left-wing enough. Um, and the reason I think that is this. His entire leadership of the party depends on the support of the activists. The MPs are against him. 
they're going to try to bring him down. What they'd like to do first is to make him look weak and confused by battling him on everything and for him not to be able to battle back. He um, will try and battle, he'll try and battle a little bit, but often he'll have to give in, and after a while, even his supporters will get fed up with him, and then you can challenge him. Right? Uh, when the evidence is obvious that the party is losing elections and the members are fed up with him because he seems to be weak, um, you can weaken him and that's how you fight him. So his only strategy must be to fight them as hard as they're fighting him. Uh, to never give in and never end uh, But I'm not sure that he's going to do that. I watched him today in the House of Commons um, with uh, the reply to David Cameron and he was really weak and in particular uh, when he was pressed on the question of whether he opposed, whether he opposes the action we're taking against ISIS in Iraq, he refused to say that he still opposed it, even though obviously he does, and clearly he should be clearly saying that. But I think he doesn't want to open any more rows with his own MPs. He just has to recognise he's never going to have, not have rows with them. He has to beat them or be beaten by them. Uh, and there we have the Sorry. Um, let me try to say, I know you're no longer an editor, but there was an article about um, uh, an Israeli schoolgirl who had written um, to, a, to an English professor and an expert on horses and asked um, for her help on a school project. Um, the, she refused and wrote back to the schoolgirl saying that because of BDS, so that's... Um, boycott di this Diversity. Uh, sanctions, she was not prepared to engage in a conversation with a 13 year old girl, um, who which was old enough to ask her, to write to her, was old enough to, to understand what the Israeli government was doing and describe the Israeli government as Nazis. Now, obviously, having discussed already your, your background, I can see that for any Jewish person, particularly something that you know would be offensive, I'm not, I know you're no longer an editor, but how, I mean, does that cause more damage in terms of who does that, who does that? I mean, you're saying people don't look at politics, people don't. Yeah. Do, do you think that causes more damage to the Jewish community or to, to the Israeli government or whatever by highlighting the idea of no. that or the it cut you? Well, you? okay. So the, the first thing is that, that you're right in thinking that one of the things that we should be aware of is that most people aren't following this issue. Uh, I remember that I went to, um, I used to go to a barber in Hendon that was called Hendon's Most Hygienic Barber. And I never understood why until I went to Hendon's Second Most Hygienic Barber. <laughs> this guy who used to cut my hair, he worked out that I worked for William Hague, and he was absolutely furious about Cyprus. And every time I went there, he, the, the latest thing about Cyprus he would tell me, but the first time I got my hair cut, I failed to work out whether he was a Greek Cypriot or a Turkish <laughs> Cypriot. So I didn't know which side he was on. Uh, and he would go on and on to me about all these things, but I never knew what he was trying to tell me. Um, and for most people, uh, Israel is like that. They're not that interested, and they don't know about it, and they're not following most of the issues. So one of the things that we do is we're like immensely sensitive for the nuance on the BBC News about it, when actually, in fact, most people haven't even gained the nuance. And so we can afford, we can afford to be not as concerned about it. However, that's not to say that BDS is not quite serious, and quite a shrewd assault, I'm afraid. Uh, because um, if you isolate, as, you, as I explained earlier, mm -hmm. by trying to isolate behaviour, you do absolutely make, uh, make it problematic. And the only thing we can do is try to, um, to, to normalise it as best as we possibly can. And to, to try to, um, in other words, to try to trade with Israel and to try to bring Israel into the cultural events and to try to battle back against uh, BDS. And um, it is actually a tough attack. It's the most monstrous attack. Um, she would never dream of sending that back to an Iranian school child, for example. So it's outrageous. Um, but um, the, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, it's serious and we have to battle back against it. Can I follow up your comment about integration and uh, your thoughts on what I think was the last item on the BBC News last night, which was a story about uh, Stamford Hill thousand schoolboys being educated solely in the Talmud and yeshivas from 7 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, and how the, the spotlight now is on for these Jewish schools in addition to the Muslim and Christian schools which I've highlighted that we've been Yeah, well, I don't... I don't um... I feel quite strongly about it, actually. I don't think that anybody, any British school child should be, um, uh, should be denied the right to learn about things like Darwin's theory of evolution 
um, or um, has arrived at proper English essay for mathematics. Um, even though obviously um, it's their human right also to do it in a Jewish school and to um, learn about the Talmud too. Um, but uh, I, so I, I think it's unfortunately the case that um, our concern with Muslim integration, which is mainly about preventing people from carrying out extreme acts um, on other people, um, spills over into concern about the Stanford Hill community who basically keep themselves to themselves, and so therefore the extremism is, is crucial. Um, but nevertheless, it's hard to argue with the principle being put forward, and I think that um, we shouldn't react against the insistence of the education authorities that these schools teach um, the basic curriculum. We should accept that if somebody wants to live in Britain, um, and it's one of the reasons I believe very strongly in the state of Israel, uh, is there has to be somewhere in the world where uh, people can go if they don't want to integrate into British life and they do just want to have a Jewish life that doesn't touch on being a British Jew. Um, that has to be available to people and we have to defend that right. But if people want to live in this country, then I think it's very important that some of the basic rules of citizenship are here to um, I'd like to ask you about Syria. Um, because I'm speaking as asked it, given that there's a, a sure. raging debate going on in the House of Commons at the moment. Um, having lunch with colleagues today and we were talking about how the boat's going to go and we realised that it's probably going to be a yes vote because otherwise this debate wouldn't be happening in the House of Commons. But I think people are very worried for a number of reasons that the, the arena is very crowded with people chucking bombs at Syria and that not everybody that is involved in chucking bombs at Syria actually agrees. Like, for instance, the Russians want to support um, Assad, whereas we don't want to support Assad. And bearing that in mind, if we do go ahead and we do get involved with bombing Syria, what reassurances can you give us that this isn't going to blow up into something much, much bigger and, much, and quite out of control? And also, what if we achieve what we want to achieve, or you know, the British government achieves what it wants to achieve, which is doing something about ISIS, but also doing something about Assad as well? What sort of structures and administration is going to take over, given the part of state that Syria is in at the moment? Okay, so the, the, the answer is I can't give you a guarantee of any kind. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of um, Islamic extremists who want to kill us all. Uh, particularly the Jews, but also Christians too. Uh, and um, we are faced in a struggle in which we have to try to uh, produce whatever security that we can. Uh, we know that bombing uh, in Iraq is, uh, and Syria isn't going to solve the situation because the Americans had 130,000 soldiers in there for 10 years and it didn't solve the situation. Uh, but that's not the question. The question really is, um, is it better uh, to be involved in this action or not to be involved in this action. My own view is that um, we cannot possibly allow uh, ISIL or ISIS to create a state in Iraq and Syria. It's a very, very dangerous thing to allow them to do. If we, set, if we allow them to settle into creating a caliphate in that area uh, and gradually to expand that caliphate uh, to use the resources that are there uh, and to force the um, to force all the uh, Sunni organisations to make buyouts to Baghdad, right? And we are uh, in a uh, in a fatal situation, particularly if we do that, um, despite having been asked uh, to join in the effort by our closest allies, and we've said no, we're going to allow this to happen. I think it will be a very dangerous thing to do. Um, so um, I don't hold out uh, that we can create a democratic structure in Iraq and Syria uh, by, by joining the French and American bombing campaigns. Um, but I do think uh, that we will make it harder for ISIS to create a fairly dangerous state. Um, the truth is that I think we have taken a very, we're taking a very long time to adjust the fact that we're in a pretty serious war with these people. 
uh, and that um, we can't just leave it alone. Um, I don't believe that it's the case that just by involving ourselves we're making it even worse. Um, I think that the truth has always been that, that, um, that, that we leave it, these people will become more powerful, and as they become more powerful, they become more dangerous. Um, and um, they will eventually, what will happen is that ISIS will finish the near war of trying to kill all the Shias and the Alawites, uh, and um, they'll turn to the far war, which is with us. Um, so um, I don't think we have much choice, and um, the fact that it is a frightening and uncertain situation uh, isn't isn't, in my view, the conclusive argument. One of the things I point out is that in 1941, the Americans came to war in Europe and they didn't leave till 1990. In fact, they still haven't really left, but their troops didn't properly leave till 1990. By 1990, they were fighting, uh, as it were, or resisting the forces that they had actually come to Europe in alliance with uh, to fight somebody else. They were in alliance with Germany and they were on the other side from their Russian allies who'd been there. Uh, they'd come to Europe to secure the independence of Poland, but Poland was actually under the Stalin, uh, had been under Stalin and Brezhnev. In other words, almost everything that we say about ISIS, which means uh, it's totally pointless because one group of nutters will take over from another group of nutters, and why should we officiate between the nutters, was exactly what we did in the Second World War. Sometimes you can't let the nutters settle, and I think this is one of those situations. Something that has always really um, impressed me on reading your written work, which um, I've always enjoyed, or my family have always enjoyed as well, is the versati total versatility um, and the broad range of subjects that you are able to write on. Whether it be your in depth political commentary, whether it be your think tank, which my sons enjoy, which is your statistical football commentary, apparently, um, or whether it is your notebook, which I actually read every single weekend. I turn to it straight away every weekend at the bottom of the Times, which really is an in depth um, comment on, on um, current affairs. But actually added into it is a little bit of your life in Pinner, your son's a mitzvah, and as a Jewish mother, I'm delighted that you're such a good Jewish son that you often put little snippets about your mother. Really. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to thank you so much because obviously not only in your written work, but having heard you speak, your depth and your 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 interest and your broad knowledge um, has obviously engaged us this evening and given us a wonderful opportunity to hear you. We would like to thank you so much. For